Appreciate everybody showing up today. <laughs> and uh, we're going to forego the typical round the room, introduce ourselves in order to give our panel uh, plenty of time to discuss the issues at hand and the topics we kind of laid out in front of them. We are going to have this be very interactive. So throughout the conversation, if you have, if you've got a question, just raise your hand and people acknowledge you. Uh, we've got three different people speaking today. Pete Dolan of Walsh Colucci, uh, a large law firm in Prince William County, does a lot of real estate and zoning land use. We've got Truett Young, who's VP of Land with Stanley Martin, uh, one of the large residential developers here in the DC metro area, as well as Russ Gessel, who can partner, is also a large developer, headquarters out of Gaithersburg, but is very, very heavily invested in Prince William County, a lot of mixed use and heavy industrial flex space throughout the county and the city of Manassas. So with that, quite simply, uh, people turn it over to you and let you guys go from there. Great, thanks very much, Gary. And I think to reiterate, um, kind of want this to be informal and interactive we've got a great group of people here thank you all for coming out and uh, being here today so um, I'm happy to take questions if we touch on a topic and you want to chime in we can do that and keep rolling through so I thought I'd just start off with a little bit of an acknowledgement on the new strategic plan goal a lot of people in this room are aware of that but just to kind of reiterate it Prince William County adopted a new strategic plan with a goal that suggests that we ought to have the 35% of the county's tax base from the commercial stock. A uh, little question on even how we measure that, but we're, uh, for some context, we're currently 14% in this county. So needless to say, it's uh, an understatement perhaps to say that's a pretty aggressive uh, role. There's been some follow-up discussion and acknowledgement that it's pretty much an unattainable goal. Um, but it's certainly a goal that's been adopted and it's caused for more of a focus uh, among uh, industry and among county staff. Uh, what is the appropriate goal? What is that? It begs those questions. What's the appropriate mix? What's the appropriate ratios as we start looking at projects? Do they want to be residential, with office, all office? And, and those are some of the topics we hope to get into today. Um, so with that sort of backdrop and context in mind, I'm going to start off with uh, Russ. Um, you know, I'll reference, there was a few months back now, I guess, in a, a couple articles in the Washington Post that suggested, look, this traditional office, suburban office park, um, that idea is dead. It's now never going to happen again, dead on arrival. I'll start there with you. I know you're a developer of office, retail, combined with residential. Thoughts on that? Were they right? Is it dead? Yes and no. I mean, over the past 20 years, we've developed some 14 office buildings in the, in the, in the D.C. metro area. Seven of those were Prince William County. And uh, so, not completely there. But changes have been drastic. How people use space, how much space they need, and where they want to have their workplace have all changed drastically. Uh, I have a slide uh, on, on uh, Heritage Hunt. This is one of our projects that I'll show. I, I really not to see it now, but really, but you know, that's an area where we've done six office buildings over those last 20 years in Heritage Hunt alone. Four small office condo buildings and two center for class A buildings. And, and what has changed in the time frame that we've developed those is that now it's tough to finance our next office building because in the DC metro region there's 65 million square feet of vacant office space. So that's a pretty big issue, you know, that's the 800 pound you know, elephant in the room. Uh, so things have changed. In, in, in Montgomery County, the, the articles that we mentioned, there have been a series of articles in the post over the last couple of years that the suburban office park is dead. It's a dinosaur. We used to brag about being an office park developer. We don't brag about it anymore. We're actually going back to old office parks where we work and seeing what do we need to do to change it, to breathe life into it, to change it into more of a mix of uses. So I would, I mean, to not take too much time on this. Yes, it's an it's an issue. There's a lot of office space and how people want it and how they use it is changing. And that's a real challenge for us out here in the suburbs deciding how we go forward and how we create the kind of places where people do want to have their workplace. 
So let me let me segue that over to you, Truett, using your example of if it's changed and we're seeing um, presumably a mix, because we're all familiar enough with some of your projects that more of the viable projects going forward is not the standalone office park, but rather retail, retail service, leisure retail, and residential. So over to you, Truett, do you, is that something that your, you and your company are seeing? Is, is that where people want to live? Is that so, the going forward? So we're seeing, uh, there's, a, there's a, a number of different trends in the market. But, you know, going a, a, a little deeper into what Russ is talking about, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time discussing, you know, office buildings and commercial, you know, pure office commercial uh, in the context of how, our, how it works with our development. You know, we always get the questions from different politicians or different staff members about, well, in this project, why don't you have office buildings? And um, I, I was explaining last year, uh, or a year and a half ago, our company moved out of the Reston area. Uh, uh, our, our Chantilly, our, our Metro DC operations group for Stanley Martin actually moved to out of Reston into Chantilly just because of the sheer volume of available space and the cheap rents uh, in the Westfields uh, business park. So, uh, you know, Westfields effectively makes it almost impossible for Prince William to com compete on a large scale for office, office tenants. <coughs> um, at the same time, a year later, uh, Westfields is now going through a big comprehensive plan amendment where they are, they, they are now dropping a Wegmans in the middle of Westfields they're replanning a bunch of the office space to residential to try and start creating the mix of uses to actually breathe some life into it because Westfields was dying. And the, the, the Westfields Business Association realized that and actually went through the process. But that's on kind of a, a, a macro scale just because it's, it's sheer size involving that, you know, multiple different, you know, many different uh, uh, you know, office developers that they've taken you know, as a business owners group and figured out that that's their solution. Uh, for, from our standpoint, we are seeing that the trends are there is much less availability for pure greenfield development. So you know, back in the day, everybody would just rezone and develop farms. You know, we had a lot of farmland, we had a lot of open area. That was you know, this is what you know, we want growth to be here. We're going to grow it, and now it's gotten to the point where uh, you know, residential has become uh, such a, uh, a a dirty word with the constituency that it makes it very difficult inside the, the, the development area to, to develop, you know, just pure residential greenfield development. So we're now working our way through what we refer to as what's left. It's either projects that have, you know, significant development issues um, that you have to figure out how to solve generally engineering wise, or it's redevelopment of, uh, you know, existing residential areas that are larger lots that you're going to make into smaller lots, or in, in certain cases, where appropriate, it's converting office space to residential and, and, and creating more mixed use, uh, in, in not office space, but actual office planned areas and, and, and mixing in commercial or uh, residential to create some more you know, what are lifestyle centers, effectively. Um, and, and that's really yeah. the, the rub that, is where that. Well, I mean, the example of you moving from Reston to Chantilly is, is an example that the office market is not dead certain areas you get some price differentiation some companies will elect to move there for the economics it was less expensive right didn't have the amenities less expensive resting has them it's expensive so what that means is the commercial tax assessments and the commercial tax revenue from those areas like Westfields starts to go down people are having to lower their rents to attract the businesses and say we are going to pick those businesses who are willing to come here without an amenity base and come here for the lower rent. And so the tax assessments go down, tax revenues go down, and the jurisdiction notices that. So Fairfax has undertaken what they're doing is this comprehensive plan amendment that Truett mentioned to try and increase the activity there, increase its desirability, ultimately not just because everyone to make everyone happy, but to get the values back up to get that tax base back up. So when you're talking about having a you know this 35 percent moonshot uh, you know commercial tax uh, percentage of the base, every jurisdiction has a goal to increase their commercial tax base. That's not crazy. What's crazy about it is setting a number that is a little bit ridiculously high and that's causing staff to have to speak to that 
every time they touch an application of ours and having to have us try and defend something uh, and have a negative discussion about that when we could be talking about more productive things about our applications. Well, let's, let me drill down a little bit more on that point, Russ, because we're, we're, it's interesting, 35%, and where did that number come from? <coughs> what do we now do with that becomes the next relevant question. That's a strategic plan goal. We now have land planning to do, right? We have a comprehensive plan that's going to unfold in Prince William County ahead of us. How do we trans that goal, or do we acknowledge that goal is just unattainable? We have to rethink that goal. But I think some of us in this room have heard Rebecca Horn of the planning director's presentation that takes the yields of our current comprehensive plan and everything in this county that is non-residential doesn't attain the goal if you build that out. So we, we really got to take a hard look at that number, I'd suggest. But to drill down, what is, and in today's Prince William County uh, comprehensive plan, we have all kinds of ratios, right? We've got ratios of residential to office and commercial. And a lot of times, we've heard this theme before, the residential of office is up here, 75%, and down here is residential and retail at 25. That's a reoccurring theme in today's comprehensive plan. Question maybe to both of you, what's, what's the viable mixed use? What's the right ratio? Is there a, is there a, what kind of factors come into that? Is it an easy formula? I don't know that anybody actually knows the answer to that. Yeah. But I mean, we need to figure it out, obviously. Yeah. So, I mean, set a target. We want to, you know, we want to be, I think the, the goal should be we want to be balanced in our tax base. Whatever gives us the highest revenue generation, you know, through a right mix, creating successful places and, you know, placemaking. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, increases values of all product types. And I think it ultimately benefits the tax base and the tax rate. Well, based on your success with Heritage Hunt, maybe you can draw from that. We had a presentation one time, Peterson Company was in here, and their point was 75% office to residential 25 with retail. Uh, they too didn't admit, I don't know where that balance is, but this one's off. This one is not correct. That's got too much office. Heritage Hunt, uh, any, you know, that's been successful. You've done a lot of office there. How does the office there relate to the residential? What's that mix there? Well, we might as well put it up on the screen. You want to talk about it? Yeah. Is that, can you do it, Brandon? So, Heritage Hunt, I mean, we're, you know, U.S. Home 1R did the 2,000 unit active adult community and approached us in 1998 if, if we'd be interested in being their partner on their quote-unquote commercial frontage. Uh, so the, the 2,000 units are back in here. This is where the gate is to the gated community. And they asked us if we'd be involved in the development of their commercial front door. And uh, we were office building guys. This was 1998. Yeah, we're office park developers. So we said, yeah, great, this is going to be uh, a great place for office. Well, over the ensuing almost 20 years now since we became our partner in 2000, we've been struggling with the office component of the project. We thought, you know, it, just to orient you if you don't know, this is Route 29 and this is Interstate 66. So this is the, Gaines, the new Gainesville interchange. So if you get off the exit ramp, that puts you on 29 North, that takes you up towards the battlefield, it puts you at the traffic signal at Heathcote Boulevard. So this is Heathcote Boulevard, out to Cat Harbor. <coughs> so, you know, office building guys, perfect office location, Interstate 66 visibility, not so great for office. Again, there's 65 million square feet of excess office space in the region. That's not the case out here. The tenants we do have here are people who are moving out from Fairfax want to be closer to their workforce, which is the workforce, you know, to the west of here. But, flip the next slide, Brendan. So everything in Heritage Hunt is developed except what's highlighted here. Office, 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 office. A couple of townhouse lots that are under development that Truett bought from us in the last year. A couple of retail pad sites. But largely, it's the office that hasn't materialized. Nobody can fault us for not trying. <coughs> We've done everything we can do out, out there to, you know, we we're office guys, we know how to do it, but there's a certain supply and demand. If we build out the rest of this office at the same 
annual absorption pace that we built the first six office buildings out, it could take 35, 40 years for that to be realized. So how's that going to get you to 35% is the question of the day. How are you coming up with these numbers? How, are you, how is it that you're saying that, um, my name is Susan Jacobs, I'm a realtor, uh, I do some, some commercial. Um, there's nothing in, in that quarter that's, for, as far as I know, for sale or lease or anything. <coughs> So how how are you? What's making you say there's no um, no interest in office space out there? So your perception is there is interest, but not available office space. There is not any available office space that I'm aware of. In that, I mean, I will use my company just as an example. Um, a little over, or well, not quite a year ago, we moved into the building which was known as Nova uh, or Inova, and. We took 5,000 square feet. Well, guess what? We need more office space, but there's none to be had. We're break ground on this office. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, and I, well, I there is a dynamic there. Like I said, that 65 million square feet of, of glut of office space is not in this submarket. You're no, right. It's not. <laughs> and all of the six office buildings, you know. This is where county's economic development office is in our building here. Supervisor Canlin's office is in our building here. These are smaller office condominium buildings where a lot of offices like yourselves and a lot of medical. Uh, when we rezoned the area that I just mentioned that Truett has purchased from us, where the lots, townhouse lots are under development now, that was originally commercial land. So realizing we had plenty of office land to say grace over we changed the land use of this to allow some more townhouses in there it's a little bit more complicated story than that at the time we agreed that we would start an office building before the first building permit is pulled for the residential and that towards the end we would start another office building that was only four years ago we we would not agree to that arrangement again today because of our fear of the office market out here. Now, on the other hand, we were prepared to start this office building in conjunction with this residential work two years ago, but we couldn't get financing because we were ready to go and build that building. We believe we could fill it out here in this submarket, but the lenders in the region look at a 65 million dollar a 65 million square foot glut of office space and see declining rents in a lot of areas and they're a little leery of investing in a suburban office building let me let me, let me take the same question this idea of ratio and where does residential want to be versus commercial back to true it and let me do it by way of mentioning one statistic Frank and i were talking about i think it was the uva's latest uh, population projections for Prince William County in the next 20 years they're expected to grow by 200,000 residents that is the the demand it's coming right it, it, it will come we need to find locations for that where do they go what where do you find you obviously know your demographic pretty well um, do you follow the retail if you need that what's the proximity of the retail to your residential is that important what, so yeah so it's important um, you know one of the I guess the issue specifically is uh, better neighborhoods have better amenities. Retail, parks, schools, all are amenities. So in, in Prince William County, there is going to be a shortage of homes. It, it, it Honestly, it does not matter where they are in the county as long as they're in the county. They, we are, we are, uh, we're going to hit crisis levels, I'm guessing, in 2021 because nobody's putting any new lots on the books. So from a, from a, a generally, um, I, I would say that yes, I mean, you know, there, the areas that, you know, our best selling neighborhoods are on the west end of the county that are near amenities or on the east end of the county that are near transportation, uh, near 95. It's just, it's a different, there's just so many <coughs> different demographics and so many different people looking for different types of housing here. You know, we do really well with entry level uh, single family attached product and two over two products, but we also have you know a significant number of single family attached homes where people come and they move to Prince William County where they're relocating out of Fairfax County because it's affordable and they can have a backyard for their kids. And the schools in this county, 
you know, there's a lot of noise about them off and on, but they're really great schools. You know, by and large, you've got a, you've got a county that has, you know, uh, no matter what the narrative may be, uh, that, that's got great schools, that has decent transportation, that's getting better every day, uh, and that has a really good retail base. But that's driven by, just like Fairfax, when they, you know, when when they were growing, it's driven by the people that moved here. You know, people come first, everything else kind of comes afterwards. It's just the way you know the cyclical part of our of our business is. Uh, does that answer your question? It, it does, it does. Any suggestions, again, I made the reference to comprehensive planning coming next. Any suggestions as to what Prince Lynn County needs to be thinking about? Um, yeah. So so the CDC and the RAC are two comp plan designations that are designed for mixed use, and that's what we yeah. were referring to as being 75% commercial office and 25% residential retail. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because it, 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 you can tell it doesn't work by virtue of any plan that was done to the CEC or the REC. It comes with waivers where we've had to ask, hey, you know what, this doesn't quite work this way. Um, Peterson and Fairfax Corner had, you know, when they went through the Fairfax Corner development, which you guys may, you know, may be familiar with, they started off with a significant amount of residential, a significant amount of retail, a significant amount of office, and a bunch of surface space parking. But as the project matured, they started getting rid of, of, of parking lots, uh, surface park parking lots, and putting in you know, structured parking. It's the way these types of communities work. It's not really the mix in the end. You may be looking for that mix in the end. It's really the mix in the beginning. Residential subsidizes you know, these types of town centers. Residential is the highest and best use of a piece of property from a market standpoint. It's the easiest to sell and it pulls the most value. So a lot of developers like you know, whether it be Buchanan or anybody else is developing a piece of property, if you inject residential into the front end of a project, we will inject enough cash and capital to make the rest of the project go. And that's the only reason that some of these projects actually work, because of lending issues. So and I'm, what we did here was to facilitate this project to be able to realize the residential, this last phase, and to build that next office building rather than doing a typical development where we would develop the lots and sell them incrementally to the home builder, we worked with Stanley Martin, sold that land to them in bulk, mm -hmm. and we were using that money to finance the office building. So is it fair to say I'm hearing a theme of be flexible, don't phase, to your point, Truett, don't phase it such that you can't come right the market's ready, and don't phase it such that if office or something else wants to go forward concurrently, that they can't do that. Um, to help us out on this ratio, we seem focused on that somehow. Um, what, what's the ratio, at, do you have any idea of the ratio generally at Heritage Hunt as it's built out, Russ, just to give us an idea? This is about 30% residential. So it's not much off this one. Okay. But I have to look at how, from a, from a plan standpoint. From a plan standpoint, but not yet built out. Right. That. Yes. Okay. Fairfax Court is almost 50-50. Yeah. Maybe a little more than 50-50 residential, more than 50% residential and it functions. Yeah. It's, it's being built out. Mm -hmm. What's built here is 50 acres of commercial and 30 acres of residential. Okay. Well, we uh, just to go closer to home here, uh, we can go right across the street, right, to the Manassas Gateway uh, right. development, and it's unique because you're both partners there um, in that that asset. What, what? Let me ask a couple questions there. How is that any different, or what's what's uh, what's the city done well with you, or how have they planned that, and what's that look like? Well, you want me to go first? Me the first the city was, uh, <laughs> That's how it's building it, too. Right? <laughs> right. I mean, the city has been marketing this for decades, and, and it was going... Do you, I mean, do you know where it is? Is everyone... Mm -hmm. Patrick, what sure this is? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you do a quick <laughs> overview? Location-wise, it's... I mean, here's Prince William Parkway. 28 is up here. Here's Godwin. This is where the DMV is now. I'm going to steal Jim's joke. That's not Lake Manassas. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, we, we talked to the city, and they had this zone for what we thought was the wrong kind of residential. They did have some residential zoning in place, but they were primarily focused on marketing the commercial area up by the lake. And the commercial land was in, in no condition to be marketed. You couldn't have an individual building pad 
identified and or ready to be developed. So you couldn't pick that piece and promote it or, or sell it. You were constantly looking at this holistic mass of land and, and just talking about it. Well, when, when we met with the city, we proposed a different mix of residential units, some for sale, some townhouses, and uh, not just multifamily. And we proposed that the residential be allowed to go first because it, as Truett says, it tends to subsidize some of the other uses around it. You bring people, it attracts some retail amenities. You sell lots residentially, it generates revenue that you can help facilitate or subsidize the commercial. So the deal here was is that as we developed the first phase of the residential, we bought the land, and so the city got revenue. And as one of our, and we contracted with uh, a home builder, so we knew who was going to buy lots from us eventually. And we treated as a cost of the residential about two million dollars worth of improvements: water, sewer, some stub roads, and the grading of the commercial area. That enabled the commercial area to be positioned for sale. Uh, and if you saw, well. Austin Holiday Corporation has since put the hotel site under contract, and we are doing a deal with Heritage Brewing. The governor was up last week, you may have seen, to do a Heritage Brewing facility in a flex building there. So, townhouses are under development, and we should pave, sorry, I'm behind schedule, we should pave next <laughs> week, and uh, Truett can start uh, building homes out here. And, and from our company standpoint, I, was, I mentioned earlier that you could pretty much put lots anywhere in Prince William County to save masses or Mass Park, and they have a they have a value. Here in this case, this is a it was an interesting play for us because it is in a mixed use development where there you know there's commercial that's coming out of the ground that is interesting. Uh, yeah, we are fascinated in this market. It's a little bit off topic, but, uh, but, but why this community works for us because uh, the public perception of what is cool is actually matters <coughs> a lot in buying a home. People will, will buy a home for a variety of reasons, and one of those reasons, in this case, we, we believe our customer base will buy homes here because there is a really great brewery going in, and there's a lot of development across the street, and there's a Fairfield Marriott, and there's, you know, there's other things that are going to be going on that are walking this, and so be a gym in the, you know, uh, uh, a gym across the street. So it becomes its own lifestyle center, located in a place that is easily accessible. In this case, you know, uh, eventually to the new VTC <coughs> station, but also to Prince William Parkway, to to 66. So there's just a lot going on that's right with this project, which is why we like it so much, uh, that it starts driving. A, uh, like a plus one value to the product. Uh, and we'll do something a little different with our architecture here to make it feel a little more urban. There's a new term that's being uh, used in the industry nationally called Serban, which I'm sure you minor types, if anybody's in here, will, will know what I'm talking about. But it's it's urban centers that are in the suburbs and they're, they're, they're becoming more prevalent because you know more people are choosing to not commute in or you know from a, you know from you know when they want to go out and eat they want to go to you know these one loudons they want to go to Fairfax Corner but they're all still out in the suburbs without actually going all the way into DC so the, you know this is on a scale of that of what, of what we're hoping to get to over time it's a lot this one definitely more than 50 50 residential cost awesome. if, if I could say something real quick when I chaired the planning commission one of the things we would hear all the time is why can't you put a hotel here or why can't you put a restaurant here and it really comes down to the fact that the economics don't work. You know, uh, you know, being the only developer that was on the uh, planning commission, it, you know, it was tough to explain sometimes to people. It's sort of like you were asking on the office. If all of a sudden, they built all six offices. There'd be a glut of office at that location, and prices would start to drop. You know, so it, it's constantly a balance. But on the hotel, just as a clarification, we don't have a Fairfield yet, although that is the plan. But just to use the hotel as an example of what Truett and Russ did is they brought the residential, they brought the brewery, and as they all know, one of Marriott's requirements is not to be on an island by itself. They've got to see everything actually physically under construction before they'll award a franchise. You know, so it, you know, it is 
quite a few pieces to the pie when you develop. In this case, Russ is the master developer, typically in their company, we are. But, you know, so we're kind of following his arrangements. But as he knows, it, you know, it's, it's a whole series of little pie puzzles here that, that we're trying to put together. It's not, you know, it's, it, it's master plan, but it has to go step by step by step. You know, and so that's one of the reasons why you just don't go out and build a hotel first and then everything follows. It's, it's the opposite. A hotel is a follower. It never goes first. Yeah. And that's it's hard for people to understand that sometimes. So, so let's go macro a little bit and attack the other side. We've thrown out some challenges and some work to do on the comprehensive plan. What does Prince William County, City of Manassas, and the other City of Manassas Park and localities here, what are, the, what are they doing right? What are they doing correct? You, all three of you are in this market for a reason. You mentioned good schools. Uh, can you comment on, and if you need a hint, Wade's in the room so you can give him a pat on the back. He's got a point through it. Right. Other than, the, other than Wade's support and the chambers, what else is, uh, what else are folks doing right? What makes this an attractive market? So, City of Manassas, Old Town Manassas, uh -huh. um, I lived there for 17 years. Uh, I guess over time figured out, Patrick, this might have been before, before you were there, why, why you were there. Uh, City of Manassas back, you know, 20 years ago or, or yeah, 30 years or 40 years ago, so it wasn't now. It's was okay. well, not that old, Truett. <laughs> I, 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 I was trying to remember when my wife moved there. And she tells me stories when she was a kid. I was boarded up. And, and, yeah. and, and, and over time, it, it started to grow and it started to mature a little bit. But I think the, 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 the most, uh, the places that are most important to Old Town Manassas, or not, not most important, but that, that probably do the most revenue at Old Town Manassas are the restaurants, right? Yeah. Which which are driven by the people that live in Old Town Manassas. So what did the city do? They figured out how to get more people living here in Old Town Manassas. I mean, exactly. that's really, it's, it's pretty basic stuff. So you, you, you figure out what works and you plan it there. You figure out how to, you know, develop lifestyle centers and you plan it there, but you plan them in a way that works and you take some of the politics out of it. You know, stop reaching for you know these these numbers that just feel good from a you know from a perspective you know politically that you know well strategically we need to be focused on this to keep our taxes down. Well, you know, congratulations. And 35 percent of of, of 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 you know the tax revenue being being commercial sounds great, but if you destroy the rest of the economy trying to get there, or cause hyperinflation in residential values because of the lack of product on the ground. Uh, it will go the other way, you know, you will exacerbate the problem. So, you know, Prince William County has done a great job with their development, development staff. You know, I say that not just because of the way it's sitting here, but, you know, it sets them apart from, uh, the, you know, from the other municipalities that we've worked in, in Loudoun and, and Fairfax County, just from the ability to get through red tape and actually get an answer. Our company has never worked in the city of Manassas, but I can tell you in the past six, eight months that we've been working on this project, since we had our first project, we couldn't be more impressed with the ability to get a call from staff, stop by their office, and get a problem solved. Uh, it's still small enough and, 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 and direct enough to where you know, people don't just hide behind everybody else, which is what we get in a lot of jurisdictions we work in. So it's, you know, encouraging both sides of development as a whole is the best thing that they can do as opposed to just encouraging one type of development and and being somewhat punitive to the other side when the other side is important as it is, just not politically popular. Another thing I would say the county's credit is figuring out what you mentioned is getting the brewery across the street, not just heritage, right. which is going to be here. They figure out how to take a farm and get it done, and kudos to that. That's going to be an amenity for this area. Okay. Russ, back to you. Any thoughts on uh, well, jurisdictions? What are we doing? Well, economic doing? development, I mean, everybody says it, you know, really, what is it? You know, some people think it's 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 it, 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 it's it's keeping your existing tenant base and keeping them happy and in, in, in fostering their growth in the jurisdiction. Definitely, some people you know put more of a focus going outside, knocking on doors, trying to attract the big fish. I mean, that's an important component of it. Also, a, a, a lot of the focus is your reputation as a jurisdiction within which it's it's easy to do business. That's Wade's, you know, that was not always this way. The reputation here was was it was a difficult place to get things through, to get things approved. That has changed, you know, 180 degrees. But, you know, other parts of it is political, sending the right message to the region. I mean, taking the Vine County Parkway off the comprehensive plan was, that is just so the wrong message to send to the region. It's, 
I, I, I don't know. This 35% goal, like I said, every jurisdiction has a goal to increase their commercial tax base. So it's not that it's a bad goal, but to put that kind of a number on it does send a message to the region that's like, what are they thinking? I mean, right. Arlington and Fairfax are nowhere near there. And, and so I, I think economic development is, is sort of all of the above. And with this, you know, focus on what do we want to be in the future, how should we comprehensively plan this county to, to create the value proposition, the valued locations like Truett was talking about, I mean, that's the goal of this comp plan. Well, one back to you, Truett, and then I do want to pause and, and get some questions uh, going. But So we started with this 35% goal, and I think sort of some of the context behind that or the impetus behind that is because that's good, that's a positive thing, we need more commercial. Why? Is there a perception or is it reality that residential is tax negative? I think there, there certainly was that discussion when this 35% came out. So, so question, I guess I'll throw it to you, Drew, at first, but to both of you. What's tax positive? What, what is residential not making tax money for the county? So it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it, you know, you will hear a lot about, you know, tax positive and tax negative housing. Um, there is a belief in Prince William County that any house that's sold under $450,000 does not generate enough in real estate taxes to pay for the services that are required by that house. I don't know how you get there. I don't know how you do the math on it. It takes people smarter than me. Uh, what I will tell you is <coughs> two things. In, in Loudoun County, uh, I guess probably two years ago, 2015, we were getting beat over the head constantly about how uh, it, they assigned a number to it. Uh, nobody knows where it came from, but they assigned a number to it. It was costing $1.64 in services for every dollar in tax revenue that a house generated. And every house that was built below $750,000 was, was uh, a, drain on, a drain on the county. So we assembled, uh, I don't know, probably 40 members of a group and paid to have uh, Robert Charles Lesser Company, uh, Lynn Bograd, who uh, does fiscal impact analysis work for the county. He actually understands the metrics for the county. He did the Dulles Rail uh, fiscal impact analysis for Loudoun County using their metrics. So we actually hired them to do an analysis of that number. And what he found was, you know, when it, when it, when it came out, uh, you know, six, eight months later, uh, and there was a press release issue. I actually brought a copy of it for, for Brandon, the, the, the report, but effectively it was like $1.20, $1.23 for every, uh, in, but, but, that was the average of every home in the county. That included Sterling, which has undervalued homes that are you know somewhat overutilized in a lot of cases. So you have to you have to blend the two. What what it, the second part of the, the the analysis also showed that it's about I think eight, uh, eighty seven cents uh, was the actual cost for every dollar, every dollar revenue for a new home. And with every new home you built, you actually changed the average and it got a little bit better and a little bit better because they were building more expensive, more valuable housing stock to tax against. Prince William County has the same issue. Oh, you, you know, we, I've had cases where I've had people come to us and say, well, you know, you're building houses across from my neighborhood and you're going to devalue my home. Well, you know, your house is, 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 is assessed right now at, you know, $300,000 for a single family detached home on a half an acre okay, we're building townhouses right now in Bradley Square, a community that was redeveloped with the old Indian Speedway that average about $375,000 for a townhome, which is completely different. Our single family detached homes, they run about $600,000 uh, all in when, when you actually go to, you know, with options and everything. So it's not politically popular, but homes in the context of, 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 of value do one, raise the value of the existing home stock around them in well, in, in well developed communities. Now, you know, there are exceptions to every rule. If, it, if you have a bad actor that's a developer, you will have a bad community and it will be bad. But I think the county's done a pretty good job of kind of ferreting out who's going to build what around here. Um, but, you know, typically you will see increase in values by building new housing stock. Uh, mainly because there's simply, you know, you're, you're at this point building to keep up, you're not building to a surplus. And nobody's putting any spec homes on the ground, meaning that there's very limited number of spec homes that are being built 
most homes that are being built are being built because they're contracted to buy. So in our community, like I said, at Bradley Square, or in this community, uh, we will sell half of that stick of townhouses before we actually start construction. We don't want large sticks of empty units sitting. Um, on the other side of that, you have the analysis that was done that does not include any commercial analysis. So the, 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 you know, the numbers that have been thrown around are all based on people doing the, you know, doing the math or the studies without taking into account the commercial tax base also. Well, we don't want the commercial tax base to have to help the, the residential along, but that fails to understand or take into account that the residential is the reason that a lot of the commercial tax base is here. They work hand in hand. It actually all works together. You can't look at one without the other. So, you know, it's really, you know, it's, bit, it's really difficult mm -hmm. to, you know, really get down at a granular level to what housing does cost because it's such a complex issue. But just on its surface, I mean, we've proven at least once that the numbers that are thrown around are inaccurate at best. Yeah, agree. Uh, Russ, thoughts on the tax, negative tax, positive of residential? I mean, it's wrong for all the reasons Truett just said to, for, for, for the politicians to say that every house is a negative, a drain on tax base, and that all commercial is some panacea. Uh, out at Heritage Hunt, as the example again, I know for a fact the Harris Teeter, 7-Eleven, inline space that we built there would not be there if not for the 300 units next door. We had Harris Teeter, had a contract with them. They said, when you get the demographics here up, we will, so there is a thing, you know, if you said there's no commercial, but residential brings the commercial. And that, it, it, you know, when I look at what tax revenue is being generated from that project, from the residential piece, from the commercial piece, I, I really should put the Harris Teeter and, and the associated retail there on the residential sheet because otherwise it wouldn't be there. You know, firsthand, we've, we've, uh, if you wonder why the Liberia Corridor struggles the way it does, yeah, uh, so Harris Teeter is going to, it looks like it, you know, it's surviving, but Shoppers is gone. There's the, the Aldi there, but you know, and, and by and large, the rest of it's strip retail, but it looks like they've had, you know, there's been some issues getting it filled. When we talk to retailers about that, because we think more should be done there, we, and, and we don't understand why it doesn't work, everybody we've talked to that's come from out of the area says, you don't have enough houses going down Prince William Parkway to Woodbridge, and you don't have any houses going down 234 going towards Dumfries. So you've got the city of Manassas, and you've got, you know, the, Manassas Park, but on the other side of that, there's no populace to actually support these retailers. So from a large scale, you know, kind of globally, when they look at it on a map, they're like, there's no way that we're going to go out and put, you know, the, the higher end retail, you know, uses here when we're not sure we have enough people that are going to actually shop there. So absolutely, I was going to say, let's pause and take some questions. Awesome. Well, yeah, one point I'd like to make too is that you know, we came up with this 35% uh, commercial base, but we, when we did it, it was all focused on retail and office, not industrial. Um, and, and one of the reasons is we've tried industrial in Prince William County, and people don't want industrial in their backyard. Right. You know, they don't want to see smokestacks. They don't want to see, you know, big plants. They don't want to see huge surface parking. Yet that's what industrial is. And yet you'll turn around and you'll talk to certain folks inside the, the county political establishment and they're like, well, we need manufacturing jobs. You know, we've got to bring this to the county. Well, good luck because the minute they bring it to the county, if it's anywhere near your neighborhood, you're going to be sitting at the county uh, council chambers and basically say, we don't want it. Okay, nobody wants the smokestack next door. We saw that a couple years ago with Fenley Asphalt. You know, that, that became a nightmare. Uh, so that, that just isn't going to happen. But then you go back to retail. Well, as these guys know, I, I have a very, very large retail project that's been uh, under construction since 2005. And you're welcome to come visit me. I'd be happy to sell you a lot cheap. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work. And I have a major, major retail player as an anchor. But just today, Nordstrom's announced they're not going to build a big Nordstrom store stores anymore except very very limited they're going to go with nordstrom local which will be have a tailor in it 
uh, a nail salon in it, and you'll come in and get fitted for your clothes that you ordered over the internet. And the same with your shoes and everything else. Apparently, this whole Amazon thing's catching on. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Mike, <laughs> Mike, you had a question? Well, just, just a comment, because I think it's important to focus on the uh, ratios. But yeah. The reality is our company's plan is 15 years old. There hasn't been any major change in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And if none of us were running our businesses on a 15-year-old plan, we'd have the same kind of result that we were having right now with economic development. Number two, in addition to the fact that it's structurally wrong in terms of what's happening today in the marketplace, uh, a lot of the land that's planned is misplanned. Uh, for example, I think they called for a major office development on uh, Bull Run at the entrance from, from Fairfax County into Prince William County. No reason on God's green earth anybody's going to build an office with. I mean, it won't be built there in 100 years. But a planner said, that'd be great because it's going to look good because it'll be a nice entrance to the county. So we've, we've essentially put all of this land into a deep freeze by either putting the wrong designation on the wrong land in the wrong location, uh, or by not adapting our company's plan over time and making it work. And, and I, what I've said to Rebecca is, I think we need to we need to think differently and big about our company's plan. The old days of a five-year, 10-year, 15-year company's plan are gone. The marketplace is shifting way too rapidly. Nordstrom's and everything else. If we need to have kind of a plan where we can almost put modules into it. We have some basic ideas about what the plan should be, and then every two or three years, we have the ability to pull out a module and plop a new module in in order to keep up with competition around the country and to keep up with what's going on around the country and the marketplace. So I, I think that this is not a time to tinker. This is a time to really step back and say, we've got to really rethink the way that we're dealing with land use in this community. A lot, I agree, great points and a lot of nods while you're saying that and it's a good segue to, so what are we going to do next? I've made a reference to the comprehensive plan. We've thrown out some challenges and some ideas. I guess the challenge I'll say to everyone in this room is please stay involved and engaged. Um, comprehensive plan is important. It's going to unfold. There's a total of eight small area plans um, that are going to uh, break out and be studied individually. Um, there, I think there's two tranches, the four, uh, four and then the follow-up four, and that's all, all that information is on the Prince William uh, website under the planning office, but I absolutely agree. Um, additional thoughts, yes, sir? Yeah, question for the panel on, on trends. I think you began to touch on it earlier, on redevelopment. Uh -huh. what, what do you see the trends in redevelopment of these, these old outdated strip malls with all this excess parking space and things like that? What do you see the trends going in the market? It's, it's happening in the region. I mean, what's difficult in that type of redevelopment is a lot of times the existing use still has value, still generates cash flow for somebody. And it's, it's great when I go in there and try and convince somebody that we should tear down this strip center and put a new apartment complex with some ground floor retail, and all they think about is the check they get every month is gonna stop. For three years while that happens so it's the as true it said the economics of what we're doing have to make sense and it's happening in areas where land values are higher uh, it'll take a while for that to happen the further out you get on the spectrum I mean, if you if you really want to see redevelopment that has just failed to take place at all I mean North Woodbridge is it, you know route one quarter is still a, 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 a mess mm -hmm. it, not not totally but but by and large i mean you know and they're still waiting for you know the right answer on what the right plan is and, and, and you know it's gone through an extensive number of way to remind me i mean how many planning efforts has that thing gone through uh trying to find the right mix to make it to make it work um, yeah. it, so it, it's it's really hard and i was fascinated you know even with the with the route one widening uh, you know, we have some property in Bromsco that we thought about picking up the pieces so we can, you know, we're, we're just a, a lot back, but we were trying to understand what it would take for us to, to, to buy some of the parcels along the front. And the assessed values of some of those little random shops are amazing to where you just can't make it, there's, there's not a business there, there's no financial model that makes sense to assemble all those tiny little junky tire shops and, you know, you know busted, you know, retail centers to make it work. So it, it's, we've seen some redevelopment in in, uh, in Fairfax along Route 1, but it comes with Fairfax pushing that process very hard and very 
heavily centric towards residential because they know that residential will come first and will actually you know subsidize a lot of the rest of the redevelopment. Prince William County has still not gotten that message. So is it the town center model that's becoming more popular? I see like some smaller towns and, and stuff like that taking a lot of those and turning them into town centers mm -hmm. and you know for the, for the millennials that's coming up. On it. Yeah, we, we found that, that, that those, you know, again, it, there's, a, there's a real value to something that's cool. And the millennials are looking to do things, looking to be able to afford it, and looking to have, you know, somewhere where they can go and do. And, you know, the, the, you know Loudon's got their, uh, their, their, their CPAM and all their planning they're doing for their metro because they believe that they're going to attract a ton of these millennials to live at, at, at the metro. You know, the, the, the conventional wisdom is, is that you know you're convincing millennials to live, to leave uh, DC, and if they can't afford DC, they go to Arlington. If they can't afford Arlington, they go to uh, Tyson's. And if they can't afford Tyson's, you step down through Reston and all these stops. You eventually do wind up in Reston, but at the values that you wind up in Reston, the models just don't really work. Not Reston, but in, in Loudon, that the models just don't really work. Uh, you know, to be in Redstone, work in Reynolds there. Right now, with, with the type of with the type of construction that we're looking for, so it's a lot of what do we want? Well, we want this. What's realistic? This financially. How do we find somewhere in the middle that, as this becomes more financially viable, you've got something that there's an actual business to do. Because if, if there's no financial model that works, it doesn't happen. We're doing a project at the Glenmont Metro Station, which is the other. And Shady Grove down to Metro Center in Washington and out to Glenmont uh, in Montgomery County. And it has a metro stop. It's been there. There's two big parking garages. It's the terminal station. But nothing has happened there for decades, redevelopment-wise. What the county finally did was put in an enterprise zone on it, which allows any development to happen without paying any proffers or they call them impact fees in Maryland, but down here they're proffers, and subsidizing their property tax for a 10-year period to get something there happening. Even with some of that, our next phase is, again, it comes down to the economics. We are, we're having to pull every rabbit out of the hat to get the next phase of development there to make financial sense. Gentlemen, the back had a question. So basically, we're, we're looking at a 50% growth in population in Prince William County, is that what I heard? 200,000? The projection I referenced was uh, 200,000 in the next 20 years. Okay. So my question is what's driving that and what parts of the county are going to be most impacted? Is it still going to be 66 and 95 corridor? How does that affect Mid-County, Manassas, so those places in between? What does that look like? I honestly don't know <laughs> how, how you don't have a crystal ball man i don't know how twenty thousand people coming to this county doesn't affect everybody 200, 200, 200, 200 sorry 200 000 people. i mean these are projections done by council of governments yeah I, based yeah. on the region and how regions grow and what's happened historically so i mean what they if you look at the projections they've made decades ago and how close they were to hitting their projections it's it's uncanny so I tend to believe the numbers. I'm not sure I know either, but one thing is we go up. And we need to be flexible as we add FAR and go in height and think, you know, as you go up, where might that make sense to do? Probably near the Virginia Gateways, the Potomac Town Centers, the Manassas Gateway. You're going to go up in height for the coolness factor of residential near the amenities that people want to go to. So we, we kind of need to be ready for that. Can we accommodate that? And right now, I mean, every year the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government uh, undertake studies in conjunction with local jurisdictions and all the local jurisdictions you know submit areas that they would like to have studied and this last session which I think is about over now the council of government agreed to work with Prince William County and study innovation and Gainesville and they call it a Metropolitan Washington Cog multimodal transit study it's underway now and what it is, is it's get your heads together. How should we plan for the future to create a node to be able to attract multiple modes of transportation? And as you know, the recent VRE study said it doesn't make economic sense to extend it to innovation or to Gainesville. 
hopefully with this kind of a result of this kind of study, a new comprehensive plan and some of these more focused small area plans, you can get innovation in the Gainesville area to start doing the land planning you need to do now to facilitate the type of development that next time that test is taken, the ridership will be there, the amenities will be there, the housing stock will be there, and the workplace will be there. Yes, sir. Two more for us. Is Heritage Hunt, have you looked at taking the office and converting it to multifamily? I know with like, uh, there's a big plan with Learner and stuff like that, Art Cello and some of those things that are planned in there long, for a long time. Uh, has there been any discussion about that? And the reason I ask about that, like, we're working on three developments out of Westfield with Bill Keach and those guys where, you know, they're basically looking at taking some of the office developments or seven buildings that are being converted into multifamily. But the difficulty there is if you're on the other side of 28 across from where Commonwealth is, you know, you have a lot of secured facilities and things like that. So you're not allowed to do it, even though the can you can get the county on board with it, you might not be able to get the local business association on board with it to be able to develop. So I just didn't know from a lease perspective, is there a, a, a way to convert some of the office to multifamily or are there lease obligations that you already have for the surrounding community? Well, we have enough office land that we could convert the land to multifamily. Uh, I, I would say the county doesn't view that favorably yet. And uh, as, as we've looked at the tax base, 35% goal issue and try to understand what we have, we're seeing some interesting things. And so residential land per acre appears to be, you know, it's true, it alluded to much more valuable than commercial land when developed. And if if you look at our Heritage Hunt example, and I mentioned this to Supervisor Candler the other day, is that we have six office building pad that could take 35 to 40 years to develop at the pace we've been. So this commercial site right now, which is worth next to nothing on your tax rolls <coughs> and pays you next to nothing, could be doing so for the next 35 years. Whereas if you put a multifamily component in there, you get instant tax base and you get it every year for the next 40 years. So you have a big, you know, two different ways to look at this. And and as a result of looking into this 35% goal, it's causing me to start to look at bits and pieces of that. And, you know, the, the county values the rural crescent and values that as a resource. And, and, they, and they have this drive or this vision of this commercial land being such a resource. And they're continually bad mouthing probably one of their most valuable resources which is their residential land, the residential potential. I mean, the other thing I don't see necessarily like in the 80s and things like that, there's a lot of the planning communities like the Dominion Valleys or the Piedmont or the Harbor Stations of the World Heritage Hunt, things like that. I mean, the plugs are a thing of the past. Yeah, you, you can't rezone them. them. You, you can't yeah. rezone them. I mean, if, if I could find 5,000 acres of land, I'm sure you find 5,000 acres of land, you should have got to be willing to drive. Uh, but or, or two thousand acres of land, or a thousand acres of land, or five hundred acres of land, and file and, and file a rezoning application. The the sheer volume of pitchforks and torches that would show up at that rezoning <laughs> uh, It's incredible. By the way, we're going to need your contact information so you can have a hearing. You can say what you said a minute ago. Sure. We got we got to respect everyone's time. Um, I'll take one more question. Sure. This gentleman had his hand up. Yeah, so. I was hoping you can speak to uh, Manassas Park. We're going to be doing our comprehensive plan review this coming year. I'm brand new. I was a new city manager there. I've been there for a couple months now. I was hoping you can provide some insight into what the city's been doing right and wrong. Well, as I mentioned, the Patrick Small is, is back here. I mean, he's been instrumental in this thing happening and helping the city. You know, the city, I mean, one thing you, you you sort of have to do, like Mike said, wipe the slate clean, think fresh. These are not times for tweaks. And, and the city had their vision for this Manassas Gateway for so long. And, you know, Patrick and, and, and Liz, uh, the Agostman were instrumental in, in getting the politicians to start to say it's time to think differently. We can't keep dragging out the pretty pictures that somebody did 20 years ago. That's not happening. Let's be realistic. Let's look to the private sector. What's going to work? I think the best thing you could do, 
is is convene a panel from the private sector to you know these kinds of people we are, we've heard from today to sit with you either before you even kick it off surely as a resource to you as you go through it I just want to do one last thing um, you know this the, the small company I referenced before Amazon was on the news and I'd be remiss because this is pretty relevant and recent right I had to read it twice but they'd like a second headquarters uh, that is equal in size to that other one that they have and they're looking in this area so we must be doing something right uh, they look to have uh, hire as many as 50,000 50, employees with an average annual total compensation exceeding $100,000 over the next 10 to 15 years. So it's just another statistic. I won't take any questions on that. I just thought it was pretty interesting to conclude with. So there's some trends and that's one of them. So that said, Brendan, uh, thank you very much to the panel. Appreciate it.